All right, Ken Korak, who I consider to be, by the way, is this 25 years for you? I was trying to think about this. With the A's? Yeah, yeah. 25th season, literally this year, yeah. You are, you are so terrific at what you do, and, and I hope that spreading through this, as I call them now, TED Tube audience, more people will understand how good you are at what you do. So what has this start, 20, 20 uh, I'm looking to see how many games, 20 whatever games that have been played so far, 25 or 26, what's this been like? to actually, at least you're working again, you have a job, albeit in circumstances that none of us could have ever foreseen. <clears throat> it's been, I guess, said semi-normal. I think it was important because like everybody else, my wife and I were sheltering in place and for four months we basically stayed home. So for me, it's given me a, a routine. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the same kind of stuff I, I have always done for all these years, which is getting up in the morning and doing my homework and then what time do I go to the ballpark? Except we're doing the pregame shows like you and I are talking now on Zoom. <laughs> um, I'll do the manager show from right here. It's uh, about 3.30 this afternoon. The home games have been fine. The road games have been a challenge, of course, because we're calling the games off the television. But like I said, it kind of almost feels normal. It's not – the A's have done a really good job with the ambiance inside the ballpark. Nothing's real about it, Ted, as you know. So, and I'm up for all the things that baseball is trying, the runner at second base in the 10th inning, and uh, the double headers have been shortened to seven innings, as you know. So, but I think the A's are doing a, a good job of trying to create as much atmosphere in the ballpark as they can. It's, it's phony, real crowd noise. Yeah. <laughs> like they're, they're, they're piping in crowd noise over the PA, but it's recorded a's sounds so you hear the drummers you hear everything that we've heard in the past so there are times i can kind of lose myself in it when the team is at home and it almost feels like it's almost a normal normal feeling um and the team's played really well i mean that's really helped so to me in trying to figure this whole thing out and and try to to get a sense on uh, of what teams might be successful the teams that can stay engaged in the season because it's very difficult with the protocols and the guidelines and the travel is not as easy as it has been in the, in the past, even though you're not flying as much. The teams that can stay engaged in the season, I think will have the best chance of success. And so far the A's have played great. So they've, they've been into it and they've played hard so far. I, I want to, I want to talk about the A's and I promise we're going to pivot to that, but let me tackle a couple of things you said in there. The crowd noise. I was a skeptic. And I watched the exhibition games, the A's and the Giants played. Mm -hmm. And I sat here in my house and I went, wow, that works. And the reason is it kept me engaged because I'm not watching every pitch. Baseball, you know, whether it's the radio in the car or mm -hmm. on television in your house is often, it's an accompaniment. And so if I'm flipping the burger on the grill, I have a crowd. Right. It kept me engaged. It kept me thinking that there was a game. Do you feel like you're calling road games from the Coliseum? Does that work that way for you? The road games are harder because it seems quieter. Okay. And I, I just, Ted, I don't have a feel. When you're calling the game off the TV and the team's on the road, I've kind of lost that feel of being in the ballpark. And, but at home, and, I've, and before we started, uh, well, while we were playing the exhibition games against the Giants, I listened to some of the other broadcasts. And I think on radio, it sounds, it sounds like it normally does. Mm -hmm. Because, and you've done a lot of radio, a lot of baseball, you kind of, that, that buzz that's underneath, that constant hum underneath the play-by-play, -play, I think is kind of a magical thing for radio. And then you can lay out a little bit and let the crowd come in. So that, that really helps the rhythm and the tempo of a broadcast. So I think for the, for the home games, we've had that. And I think, it, I think the audio, and Mike Baird, who you've worked with a lot, has, is, is just doing a, an incredible job because it's a complicated kind of uh, technical thing to pull off from an audio standpoint, but on the road, it's, it sounded quieter. And that's, that's been a challenge because I, re I really don't have a feel for what's going on inside the ballparks while the A's are on the road. Yeah. Mike Baird, by the way, audio engineer extraordinaire, for those who don't know who Ken was referencing there. Okay. You talked about some of the things baseball's implementing this year. Opening your opening night, I'm watching here. The A's are playing the Angels and I have my son-in-law who's a, Chicago Cubs fan. Despite that, I like him. And uh, uh, we're watching the game and it goes to the 10th inning. 
And Otani goes out to run at second base. And I sat there and went, oh, my God. I said, 30 years ago, if this had been put into place in baseball, no game would have gone past maybe at most at once in a while you'd see an 11th inning because 80 to 90 percent of innings you start an inning with a runner at second no one out hitters knew how to situational hit they'd score at right. least a run and unless you had a, a you know like goose gossage like you know billy wagner like strikeout demon on the mound for that inning you're going to get that run home and so i watch your game and neither the angels in the top of the 10th nor the ace in the bottom of the 10th even think about bunting Neither team even thought about walking the first hitter to set up the, the forces and the double plays. I went, oh, my God. I, uh, and Ken, I totally admit this is my get-off-my-lawn moment. How has baseball changed? It has. And then the counter to that, and everything you said is true. And I agree with almost everything <laughs> that you said. They'll say that the percentages show that bunning the guy to third base right. doesn't necessarily give you a better chance of scoring that run. And how many players right now know how to bunt that well in the first place? Right. So uh, I was really skeptical about it. I've been around doing this forever. So it just seemed like so abnormal, such a change in the way the game's always been played. But the A's haven't lost an extra inning game yet. They're 4-0. And, the, the, and, and I think that there hasn't – the one thing to me, there hasn't been anything fluky yet. In, in every game that they've won that's gone extra frames, They've been the better team in the 10th inning or the 11th, and one game went 13. So, and their club is set up to play really well in those games because they've got incredible defense at first and third. And you have a closer who can strike people out, which is really critical if you're starting with somebody at second right. base and nobody out. So, like I said, it, it, it's, it's unconventional. I'm okay with it. I don't know that I'll be okay with it if they do it next year. I have a feeling they're going to want to do it, but. Uh, you know, Ted, for this year, I think anything goes. Well, I'm happy it's not in the postseason. I've heard that. And, right. and, I, and you've made the point that I'm sure you said it, Ken, and I assumed it was correct, is that the analytics people have all their data that proves that the point you referenced, oh, it's a much better percentage to not bunt runners over, et cetera. I just, it just, I mean, my I, God, it struck me. And I, I can't fight the data if that's the case. I'm just saying it just so struck me. And I think a lot of people of, of our generation maybe scuffling a bit with this adjustment to the game, which now looks a lot, sadly, looks a lot more like slow pitch softball. That's right. And there's so many more strikeouts now. Yeah. That's that, I mean, yeah. In the old days, you'd bump the guy to third. You knew the next guy would get his bat on the ball. They have to bring the infield in. There was a good right. chance he was either going to hit a ground ball through one of the holes or hit a sack fly and you'd score the run. Some of the managers a little, af not afraid, but they're, it, it's almost like as you've done a lot of college football in overtime and it's it's similar to that from the standpoint that the home team really has an advantage mm -hmm. because they know what they have to do so sometimes in the top of the inning the managers are thinking maybe one run won't be enough so maybe we shouldn't play for one run there so uh, amen i agree there's that, a lot of different different right. levels of this thing and i assume that depends on who the opposing who the pitcher is are do you have a strikeout guy on the mound, or do you have the right. third or fourth guy out of the bullpen yeah and uh, are you going to walk the first hitter? Well, maybe not if the first hitter is a 180 hitter, right? <laughs> you right, exactly. Like you might say, I'm going to take my shot and get, see if I can get this guy out. Um, yeah. it, it is, well, it, it just is different. So let me pivot now to the Big Ten question, which because you've been doing the A's 25 years, and I admit this is a huge, broad question, but you are as qualified as anybody I could think of to answer it. How in the name of goodness have the A's kept this going? Yeah, it's really been, and it's been thrilling for me. Uh, they've been in the postseason 10 times in the last 20 seasons. They're really good at what they do. And they've had tremendous stability, Ted, in the front office with Billy Bean, who was in the front office when I started in 96. And then after Sandy Alderson traded Mark McGuire in 97, he turned the reins over to Billy. He said, you don't have to worry about this. I did it. Now it's your ball club. So I think that, and, and without rehashing things that people know about from Moneyball and the movie, they were at the forefront of analytics. Right. And they've had excellent people in their minor league system too, led by Keith Lippman, who's been with the organization for a half century. So they've kept the, the continuity in terms of the way they develop players and also with their philosophy. They're very shrewd in their acquisitions. 
And in the recent past, now Bob Melvin is the is like the perfect manager to run this ball club. And the A's have had five postseasons since he's been their skipper. So they've done a really good job, but there's a culture of winning. There's an expectation. They've never kind of submitted to the feeling that, well, you're a small market team and you're not supposed to win. So when teams, when, when players join the club and come into their clubhouse, even though they don't have the largest payroll, there is an expectation that they're going to do well and they're going to win. So they've had that vibe about the club all these years. I think the Coliseum with its quirkiness and funkiness and all the foul territory has helped things. And I also think the way they play, because, and, and this goes back even to Art Howe when, when uh, they went to the postseason four straight years beginning in 2000. They grind out games. It's, it's almost, it's so rare to see them come out and play a flat game. And they work the count. That's been, I mean, that's been well documented. But they, get, they grind pitchers to the point where by the second half and the end of the season, I think because they play so hard and they're, and they're so focused in their approach, they kind of grind the rest of the teams down. And that's one reason why they've had these great second halves, because that's been the hallmark of their success. The first half, their, their, their numbers are pedestrian. Second half, they play really well. Yeah. And, and that's a great point, Ken, because it leads into something uh, over 20 years or so, let's say, since the real money ball thing started. Uh, you know, you have hundreds and hundreds of players. So it hasn't been the same cast of characters, but they've continued to play pretty much that same way. And I go back to a story I know, uh, because after you worked with Art Howe with the A's, then I had a chance to work with Art for two years with the New York Mets. And I'm sure we share the same respect that most people in baseball would have. Art Howe is a tremendous man. Um, but I know <laughs> that there was a, a point when, Art and Billy may not have been on the same page in how to manage games when Art was still managing the A's. And the word came from the original architect, Sandy Alderson, to Billy Bean that Art Howe was hired to manage the Oakland A's way, an Oakland A's organizational philosophy. We always heard about there was the Dodger way, right? And there was a Cardinal way. We used to hear that even Mm -hmm. growing up. Well, there was kind of an Oakland A's way. And, yeah, yeah, for and, sure. And that, and that Art had to be reminded, <laughs> is probably unpleasant for him, that he was hired, and he was hired by Sandy, but he was hired to manage the Oakland A's way, not Art Howe's way. And that's always stuck with me because through multiple managers and now, of course, Bob Melvin's long run, it seems like it's the same thing. It is, and that's proliferated around the game. No one can deny the influence of the front offices around baseball. And whether it's suggestions or it's more forceful than that, the front offices have their say and they're involved. But as a manager, you still have to keep your own authority in the clubhouse. I think that's something that that Bob Melvin does extremely well. Mm -hmm. He has the respect of his players. So there's a blend there where you know that the front office has its input its influence. They have all the numbers and the analytics and suggestions on lineups and things like that, but you still have to let the manager manage because that's so important for the chemistry of the club and his relationship with the players. He still has to be able to have his respect. And so I think the A's have been able to do that. Um, And the other thing, and this is, you know, off the subject a little bit, but we have to make the point that, that the dissonance between art and Billy was accentuated in the movie. Yeah. Let's face it. I mean, Philip Seymour Hoffman, may he rest in peace, was a phenomenal actor. But in no way did he resemble art, both in terms of the way that he looked and also yeah, his right. character. Right. So that really wasn't that fair. I thought it was a great movie. And no. parenthetically, I'm still getting minute little uh, checks from Sony Pictures for residuals. <laughs> like, like a check will come in for $13.40 and my wife will send me a picture of and say, hey, we can go out to dinner tonight. So um, I'm but, lifting, uh, I'm lifting my morning Joe, Joe yeah. to you because yeah. uh, I, I, I still get asked this story 30 years later. I'm, I have a call of mine in a few good men uh, from my years of the Minnesota right. twins for which right. to this talking moment, that's exactly what I've received <laughs> for that zero. Well, 
They, so good for you. I'm, I, I credit that. They used a lot of our calls and we're indebted to them for doing that because they were going after authenticity. I didn't get paid for any of that. Yeah. But I was officially a cast member, Ted, because I acted a scene for about an hour with, you know, Bennett Miller, who's this big Hollywood director, is an Academy Award right. nominee and all that. So I did a scene with him for an hour that is on the proverbial cutting room floor somewhere. <laughs> it, but because I was officially in the movie, yeah, they had to pay right. me. They, they, but they, for the calls, nothing. Good. And, and I totally agree with you, by the way. And again, I, the movie came out and I was with the Mets and Art. And I know he was stung by that, as he should have been, because he was yeah. a good man and a proud man and didn't deserve that, that portrayal. That just wasn't, that wasn't right. And so, and, and the reason I brought up the story was, was not to denigrate Art, because like I said, Art doesn't, Art doesn't need me to defend him other than to say there was an, it was an interesting but moment yeah, to learn, to learn from me firsthand to hear the stories that the Oakland A's had decided, this is the way we're going to build our organization. This is the way we're going to play. It's an organization. It's not an individual. One of the things that's interesting about that, that's a little ironic, if that's the right word, because the A's, especially when Melvin first joined the club and they got to the postseason at 12, 13, then the wild card game in 14, they really were into matchups. And that was, a, that was a big part of what they did, where he would pinch hit for people all the time. A righty came in, the lefty would come up. And they'd platoon players. And that was, a, that was kind of a big part of the evolution of their analysis of how to put together a ball club and also how to manage a game. But now they're almost one of the kind of the least analytical teams in the game because they've got this really good club. They have good players all over the diamonds, so they don't do that a whole lot anymore. He kind of has his lineup, and they'll platoon at second base. And, but really nowhere else right now. The catcher might get a day off, uh, depending on day game after night game or righty or lefty. So they're, right now, their lineup is more set day-to-day -day than it's been in a long time. Okay, one more, and then I want to get to this team. So one more, because it just triggered me when you, when you start talking about art. So I asked Art this question one day at Shea Stadium, just during this couple of doldrum years he was managing the Mets. And I said, okay, you have your three aces. Which guy do you gamble on for the long haul? Who do you think? And this was in 2003, I guess it was. So they were all active. Um, Zito probably hadn't, I don't think he'd gotten his big money deal yet with the Giants. What do you think he said? Just talking about the A's. I said the three, the three aces, Hudson, Mulder, Zito, and they were still going. And I, I remember just, I was just, you know, you know my guess, manager, just, just chewing the fat with them. And I said, so Artie, who, I don't you, know, because they were gamble on long-term. Right. It was hard. It was hard to differentiate between the three because they were all so good. Yeah. Hudson, maybe, I don't know. That's, it, it, that's it, what he said. Yeah. He said, and I always give Art credit because he, this was yeah. again, in probably 2003, maybe 04 at the latest. So those were the two years. And he said, uh, he said Hudson. And he was right. Hudson was the guy that by far lasted the longest. Much more, yeah. Much more than the rest of them. And yeah, he had, he had Tommy John surgery, bounced back from that. Uh, yeah, he fished a lot of good games for the Braves. Had some success with the Giants even. So, yeah. And, it, you know, that's, that's why I really thought that they had a shot to win a World Series. That the, the 01 team was the best team of that group of that of that four-year run I think this current A's team is the best team they've had the most talented club since the uh, 01 team was the 01 which year was the Jeter flip that was 01 that yeah. was 01 okay so I was gonna ask yeah. you, was that single play the most destructive play towards that goal that you talked about it goes down in history is from a, a standpoint of of plays you don't want to remind A's fans of yeah that and Gibson's home run yeah would be the two you know, it's like you don't want to go there. I called the play, but it, um, it was because the A's had a 2 nothing lead, and it was such a compelling and poignant series because the A's played the two games in New York after 9-11. We got there less than a month after 9-11. Now the A's go in there and win the first two games, and then they come home, and it's Zito against Mike Messina in the third game, which was a phenomenal game on a beautiful night, 50,000. Fans, so they still they had a two nothing lead, and even after that game, they were up two games to one. But it really deflated the club. I mean, I don't know that there's been one play. You can, I'm sure there there have been, 
in the history of playoff baseball that swung the, a series and one team seized the momentum like that play did and changed that, that series completely. Okay. So let's talk about this year's A's. Uh, what is, because I'm looking here to see how many years, how many years for Bob Melvin now? He came in during the 11 season. Gosh, they, yeah, I'm looking at that here. So this is his 10th year. Yeah. That's unbelievable. Could you imagine somebody managing 10 years? And I it's trust me. Yeah. Well, no, but I, I look, I'm going to say this because I go back. I was with Billy Bean when he was a player. Okay. So I can say, this. you imagine somebody managing 10 years for Billy Bean? Right. And, <laughs> and Billy's been with the A's over 30 years. I know. I know. Are, going back to the time that he was a player. Bo Mel is really a centered guy. Yes. And so he's, he does a really good job of kind of dealing with the front office, which I think has been a real positive thing with the relationship. But like I said earlier, also being able to manage his club. So he's had a good relationship with Billy and with David Forrest. Right. And, and, that's, and that's to Bob Melvin's credit. And I think the world of him. Um, what is the most underrated quality you touched a little bit on Bob a little bit ago, but what's the most underrated quality that's made Bob successful? Well, I don't, I think there, there are a lot of things. First of all, he's a little bit like art in that he's very centered. He's a gentleman. Um, he understands he's, he's really good with the media. He tries to, it's not just a chore. He tries to give us something good every day. He's he, he never misses a thing when it comes to strategy. So he embodies everything you would want. He, he kind of checks all the boxes mm -hmm. as a manager. And so I think when someone, he's really a good, he's a good solid person. And sometimes that can mask your competitiveness. I think that was the case with Art because Art had this kind of stoic demeanor. Yeah. And when you saw him, he didn't have, there, there was, his face didn't give off many um, expressions, but he was an intense competitor. And so is Bob Melvin. I mean, he really wants to win. And I'll tell you what, he really wants to win a World Series with this ball club. And the other thing that has really helped him, I think, here is that he's from here. And so to manage his hometown, now obviously he played for the Giants and he grew up on the other side of the Bay, but he went to college at Cal. So it's meant the world to him uh, to manage this club. And I think that's another reason why, and that's kind of a, almost an intangible thing, but it's meant that it's, it's even more of a, of a fit for him to, to manage the club here in the Bay Area. Yeah, and to think that here's a guy that for a while was living in his off-seasons in New York City, right? And Well, he really loved New York. Right, and now he's back. Yeah. I mean, he went, you know, you said he grew up here. He went to high school a mile from where I'm sitting right now. Yeah, uh, yeah. College in Berkeley, as you said, now 10 years with the A's. And, and, but you'll see him in Cal, for example, I'll see him in Cal basketball games during the off-season. Yeah. I think that's key because... Um, it was the same thing with Dusty during Dusty's great run with the Giants. When a manager's around in the offseason and people see Steve Kerr now with the Warriors, same thing. I, th I think that, don't you think that resonates? For sure. And I think it helps us as broadcasters too. And so, yeah, I mean, he's one of them. People can relate to him. Uh, and they know that he really cares and he cares about the area. And so when people ask him questions about things that are going on here, like in the midst of the fires right now. So he can speak with the kind of emotion that comes from someone who is kind of uh, embedded in the community. Who's the best player right now that we don't know about on the A's? Wow, that's a good... Because we know, I mean, even, look, if you're a baseball fan, you know Chapman now, and you know Olsen. You know Chapman, Olsen, Simeon. I, I would say probably Ramon Laureano. Ah. Who was now garnered his own headlines because of the little melee they had with the Astros. And then he serves a suspension for four games. He has a chance to be great, Ted. I mean, he is a guy and you, people throw out the five tool thing gratuitously, but he's, he is legitimately a five tool player. He's a great kid. He has a wonderful story, a backstory. He is immensely talented. And I think he has a chance to be a guy who can make the all-star team four or five times. So two years ago, um, I was sitting in the ballpark in Anaheim as a, as a, just a Joe fan with a bunch of people from here and Loriano, the play that I'm sure many people have seen Loriano catches a fly ball. And I, I th as I'm watching this play, I don't know who this guy is. I've never heard of him. Okay. He catches a fly ball in the warning track in deep left center field and uncorks this extraordinary throw to double off a runner at first base. 
And it's not just the, the length of the throw and the first, I think it was, I, you'd remember better than I was at Olsen at first base. Yeah. The first baseman like this never like had to move, yeah. never had to stretch. The, I mean, he threw the ball, what, 300 and whatever feet on the dime, on the dime to the first baseman to double off the runner. And I remember with a bunch of guys, and of course we were, you know, having medicine, et cetera. I dropped mine on the floor. I said, oh my God. Yeah, you know, that's like a once in a lifetime throw to see somebody not just the distance, but to put it on the money like that. He does that almost every game. Uh, he made a great catch going up, racing to the wall last night over the shoulder, full on as fast as he could go. He made a throw to the plate that almost cut down the, this kid, Lo Castro, from the Diamondbacks and almost threw him out at the plate when he had no chance to get him. So, you, you know. Ted, as you know, from, from all the games that you've done, you don't win anything unless you have impactful players. There have been years when the A's had good players, but impactful players enable you to win, get to the postseason, and advance in the postseason. So, you know, this year the A's have guys who can impact the game. That's interesting. Tell me about Lazardo, because that was the name I thought you might say, the best player that we don't know about. Well, he got a, he's, there was a lot of hype when Lazardo was coming up, even though he didn't pitch that much. Right. At Tommy John surgery, as um, a senior in high school, he went to Stoneman Douglas High, which is where they had, you know, of course, the awful shooting. And he was going there that afternoon to work out. And his coach called him and told him, you know, so that he's been, so that was a really tough time, of course, for him and, and everyone down there. But he had Tommy John surgery young. He was drafted by the uh, Nationals in the third round. And then when he was just a, still a teenager, he was dealt by the Nationals to the A's for uh, Sean Doolittle and Sean Madsen and worked his way up through the uh, A's system. But, you know, the Tommy John is not always a smooth ride. So he was brought along really slowly he threw 109 innings two years ago, but then he had some shoulder issues last year. He was twice on the DL in the minor leagues. Actually didn't even pitch that much last year. And then as we're recording this last night, he threw the, it was the farthest he'd ever gone in a professional game. He got, he went six and a third. And, um, and he, and he blanked the Diamondbacks. But entering that game, he'd only thrown 32 major league innings. In his entire career now, including the minor leagues, he's only thrown 220 innings, which is just slightly more than, of course, the full season. So if he's this good now, which he is, and if he stays healthy and makes the, the progressions you would hope a pitcher would make, uh, you know, he's a bona fide number one or number two starter. 22 years old. Yeah. Was this his first Tommy John? Yes. Okay. First of all, yeah. He was say, a, yeah. That's now become, that's a bad, I mean, even when I was still phasing out of the game, it was becoming a badge of honor. And then suddenly you heard about guys that had two. Right. And, and two and a half. Yeah. I mean, Brian Wilson, I think was probably the first guy, a prominent guy I heard of who had two, but now you hear it all the time. It's, it's crazy. And as you said, there's a, there's a path back and it's usually, a year plus later. I'm just looking to see, Ken, did you have, uh, no, the A's didn't have anybody pitch 200 innings last year. Did you ever think you'd see that when we no. grew up with three, you know, 300 was of course a major milestone. 250 was what you expected. Your top guy, like your horse would give you 250. And I'm looking at last year's stats, 184 innings pitched was your, yeah. was the best on the A's last year. I'm into guys that are horses, Ted. Yeah. Me too. I still think, and if you're going to win a World Series, look at Scherzer and Strasburg last year. Those were two bona fide guys, and you wanted those guys to go deep in a game. So I still think I want a couple guys that want the ball. They say, Skipper, the bullpen's going to take the day off. Let me get into the eighth inning or the ninth inning, because that's the real test of a pitcher in a ball club. When you're in a tight game and maybe it's the postseason, can he, if, if he's your best guy and it's the eighth inning, he says, I want the ball. I want to stay in. Yeah. But again, not to dwell too much on numbers and, and analytics, there is this feeling that you have to be a little more leery when you get second time through, especially third time through the lineup. You're better off bringing your bullpen. And all these guys throwing 96 miles an hour that come out of the bullpen. I mean, that's one of the biggest changes in the game, right, Ted? I mean, it's like everybody's throwing 97. And for a hitter, you're seeing four different guys in each game. So that's another area where the, the game is really well, and I'm not around it like anymore like you are, Ken, but that's the one thing that puzzles me because uh, that happened in 2000, 2001, 2002. Suddenly you saw guys coming up. I'll never forget 
the, it was 2001 because Bonds was in his home run run and the Giants went, were at Wrigley Field playing the Cubs and the Cubs brought up a guy from the minor leagues that you know well named Joe Borowski. Yeah. Joe Borowski's throwing 94. Well, I'm saying, if you're throwing 94, why are you in AAA, my friend? <laughs> right? right, exactly. We had a left hand, I for, uh, the, can't remember the name, the Dodgers had a left handed journeyman relief pitcher that came up and they bring him out of the pen in an August game and he's throwing 91. And I'm sitting there, same thing. I'm like, Wait a minute, you're a lefty and you're throwing 91 out of the pen? You're not in AAA. <laughs> you're in the big leagues. Right. So when I see everybody throwing 97 today, Oh, wow. How come nobody, not everybody threw 97 when we were kids, did they? And they're throwing 95 and they can't get out of double A. I know. It's, uh, well, yeah. anyway, that, that's a whole other story. Can you imagine, Ken, here's another get off my lawn moment. I, I, I pray this doesn't happen because you said horses, look, I, I, I was with a World Series championship team largely because of one person, Jack Morris. Right. San Francisco Giants won a World Series in 2014, single-handedly won by Madison Bumgarner, a horse, right? I can't fathom getting to a game six or game seven of a World Series and having Joe Buck and, and Smoltz come on and talk to me about the openers that are going to start right, exactly. the game. That's what I can't. That's another one. I just can't wrap my head around that. Which they just did in the wild card game in 18 yeah. in New York. Um, yeah, I mean, you got – to me, you've got to have a couple of aces. You've got to go, you have to have guys that can dominate in the postseason. I think they just feel like they have that. They're young. I mean, if they take the next step, Frankie Montas, I think, is capable of doing that. I think Luzardo is. Uh, if they can get Manaya back on track, uh, you know, the rest of the rotation is still good. Chris Bassett fires is throwing two no-hitters. But if you, if you have guys who can dominate, that, that's what can carry you. And like you said, with Bumgarner and Morris and – you know, back in your twins days. Yeah. All right. Let me finish up with this because we understand with everything having changed this year, the hope of a new ballpark for the A's gets delayed by at least a year, just as everything is delayed. In the interim, thank God that football's left the Coliseum. Do you think there's anything they can do to the Coliseum to bring back what was really, you know, when you started, when I worked for Finley a thousand years ago, was a really nice baseball park. It really was. It's great. You, and the weather's great. Sightlines are good, even with the foul territory. Well, yeah. they can blow up Mount Davis. I mean, that's what I'm wondering. Do you hear any right? conversation about just, anything extreme? I'll like go that? out there and do it. Yeah. Um, I just don't think it's something that, from a, a cost standpoint, that, that I'm just not sure that that would be something that would be prudent. I think, I think we'd all love to see it. I just don't think it's part of the plans and the infrastructure there. I mean, it's a stadium that was that opened in in '66 for the Raiders. So, the infrastructure, the structure itself, uh, I just it would be a band aid kind of thing at best. So, as much as it would be nice to see something like that happen, I just don't think it's on the horizon for the A's. So, whatever they can do within the ballpark to kind of enhance the ballpark experience, I think they've been trying to do that with yeah. things like the treehouse out in left field and the various new seating areas and picnic areas and things like that, uh, party areas. So they've been trying to do that to make it a little more intimate. But they're, still, they're really focused, Ted, on, on getting the new ballpark and trying to get that yeah. done up uh, north of Jack London Square. And, and I know, Ken, that's hard. And I know because I watched it firsthand with the 49ers. And my point being, it's going to be, as we sit here today and talk, it's four years at the best before yeah. that ballpark could be a reality. Right. And the 49ers went through this at Candlestick after the Giants left. How many years do you keep putting money into a place that you're trying to leave and you are eventually going to leave? And they did. They, and, it was, and it was, as you used the perfect term, it was Band-Aid. It was cosmetic. Um, and I'm wondering if there's anything that could be slightly substantial. And I, I'm, the Mount Davis thing is a joke, of course. Um, unless you could get an advance on the ex on the demolition cost and have somebody right, exactly. have somebody do it, yeah. but uh, but if you're going to be in that if you're going to be in that you know it, it is an old park if you're going to be there four more years I hope there's something that they can do that is perhaps slightly above cosmetic because at well, its best it's a terrific baseball park. They have done some things like I said with some of these party areas and yeah. seating areas, and I think that was a significant step for them, and. The fact the Raiders are gone, it has freed them up to do that. So maybe that'll happen as we move on and the, and the years go on. 
um, you know, kind of in the bowels of the ballpark, areas where people don't see, uh, there's that big Raider locker room, which the A's have taken over this year. So I think from a player standpoint, that's really, that's helped and win, will help once we get past the pandemic and you can get back to like a normal clubhouse existence down there. All right. Well, 25 years, by the way, hang on, hang on. I have it. Uh-oh. Right here. I just realized I had it on my shelf. Oh, thanks. That's great. You did a great job. Ken honored a man that uh, you worked with um, for an immense amount of years that I had the honor to work with, with as well. Yeah. Uh, I, anyway, Bill King, that's just a great, it's a great effort by you. So combination and it's still, it's still a bad, are you still getting res, uh, residual checks on the book, Ken? A uh, little bit here and there. Yeah. A little bit here and there. Um, I don't think there are that many books left, but, and I, you know, I had a lot of help. Um, Steve Ketman published the book Yeah. and uh, Pete Danko and Steve worked as, as the um, editors on the book. So uh, it was really a labor of love. It was, it was challenging because how do you capture Bill? Because he, the, you talk about multifaceted, well, it doesn't even scratch the surface with him. So it was a little daunting to me because everybody here in the Bay Area felt like they knew Bill because he was such a, a presence for so many years with, with the three big sports. So, but I appreciate that. And people need to know this, that you've been instrumental for me in my career, that 35 years ago when I started doing San Jose State football, uh, you really were a big help in that and gave me a big push. And that's when you were doing San Jose State, but you moved over to do Stanford yeah. on KCBS, mm -hmm. right? Which opened up the San Jose State job for me. And that was my entree into the Bay Area. So you've always been a great source of, uh, you know, advice, things like that and wisdom. So um, you've been, you know, we all look back and say there are people that have been instrumental. That's right. And, uh, and you've been that way for me. So I really well, appreciate it. Well, that's nice of you to say, Ken. It's unnecessary, but it's funny because we both would say that about Bill. And I've often, I think I told you for the book, you know, when I'm 25 years old, I think, and I fall into this insanely fortunate moment of following Bill. You can't replace Bill. You follow Bill <laughs> uh, when he retired from doing basketball. And, of course, the reaction in the Bay Area was, well, come on, some dumb kid coming in here. This is the great Bill King. And Bill was the guy that stood up and said, give him a chance. That's he right. said it publicly. And yeah. I'll never, ever, ever be able to repay that kindness because it was immense. I mean, that one sentence, basically, it was the Pope giving me a blessing. And, well, yeah. that's, and that, that's the side of Bill as crazy and eccentric and as goofy and as many stories about Bill that we can't tell right. <laughs> that we'd like to. <laughs> that part of Bill was such he was such a professional and such a gentleman and what he did for me with that one comment i will never ever forget very gracious that way yeah and he and you did a great job with the warriors by the way i'm not just saying that because you're a friend but i i had a you know not quite the same thing but i replaced lon lon simmons and they had this like incredible 15-year run as voices of the a's which I think was instrumental in turning the franchise around when the A's were like a moribund franchise in, in 81 when the new ownership came in. And then you, I'm in there replacing Lon, but Bill's endorsement of me meant the world to me. Yeah. Cause I've always, I've said this a lot. I, you know, that, that, that could have been a really daunting, intimidating thing. And what I've said is that, um, Bill's endorsement of me, if you're a fan of the A's and you kind of get the sense that Bill King likes this new guy, that really goes a long way. Yeah. Amen. Well, you're terrific, Ken. Ken's father, 101. God That's bless great. him. God bless him. Healthy, vibrant. 101. That's unbelievable. Knock on wood. He's doing he's exactly. doing really well. Continue that, which means you only have, if my math is right, you have about 37 <laughs> years left in the booth. Is that right? Um, Means are a great thing, Ken. We'll see. <laughs> Thanks, Ken. That's not happening. All right, man. Thank you, Ted.